I'm pleased to be joined by Sheila Karras from Empire Life to discuss disability claims management. Before we get started, a few announcements. We invite everyone on the line today to stick around after the main presentation for a question and answer session. If you do have a question, simply type it into the GoToWebinar question interface at any point during the webinar. We will do our best to address all questions at the end of the webinar. This webinar is being recorded. You'll receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording after the webinar. If you have any general questions or concerns, feel free to contact BBD by emailing socialmedia at bbd.ca. Now to introduce you to our speaker. Sheila Karras is the Director of Group Life and Disability Claims at Empire Life. Sheila has worked in group insurance for 17 years. Her career has spanned both the direct and reinsurance markets, focusing on best practices, training, and audit in disability and health claims. Sheila currently leads the life and disability team at Empire Life. She is an active participant in several CLIA working groups and is the chairperson of their 2018 Claims and Anti-Fraud Conference. She earned her Bachelor of Science from Queen's University, majoring in life sciences, as well as her Group Benefits Associate designation through the Certified Employee Benefits Specialist Program at Dalhousie University. And without further ado, let's begin. Welcome, Sheila. Thanks very much, Taryn. I am thrilled to be here today presenting this webinar with our partner, BBD. Uh, we have a lot of information to cover today, so I'm just going to jump right in, starting with industry trends. I would like to thank Mark Forrester and his team at Munich Reinsurance for allowing us to use some of the results of the most recent Munich Re benchmark study. Now, Mark presented a more expanded version of this at Empire's recent advisor conference in San Diego. So if anybody happened to have been there, you would have seen his full presentation. And this is just a summary of some of his key points. To begin, let's take a look at two major factors we talk about when we're talking about LTD claims, incidents and termination rates. Every carrier defines incidents a little differently, but generally, it's a ratio of new cases to eligible insureds. Termination rate is the rate at which claims resolve or close. And as you can see here, this trend that we're looking at today starts back in 2007, so we've got about a 10-year view. Over the past 10 years, there has been a fairly steady, gradual rise in the incidence of LTD claims. You can see this in the red bar on the graph. Unfortunately, the termination rate has not increased with the same slope. So the termination rate is shown on that blue line. And what this means is we are getting more new claims than we are closing, which is increasing the overall caseload size. We would love to know the number one factor that contributes to this trend so that we could focus on how to solve for that. But as the next few slides will demonstrate, it's actually not one big factor. It's really a combination of many different things. So what is going on? What's causing the rising incidence rates? Is it aging? I think many of us think it is partly a lot to do with the aging population. On the graph on your screen, you'll see an orange bar at the bottom. And this represents the actual increase in the average age of the insured population. The blue bar represents what we expected to see with incidence rates as a result of the increase in the average age. But the gray bar is the actual increase in incidence rates that we saw in the industry since 2007. So we hear a lot about the aging population in Canada, those baby boomers, and insurers have been prepared for years for the changes in incidence rates expected as they got closer to retirement. However, the impact this aging population has had on LTD claims only accounts for about 10% of the overall increase in LTD claims over the past 10 years. So we know there is an impact, but it's only about 10%. So let's look at how much the economy accounts for. This slide, again, takes a 10-year view with the red line representing the incidence rate and the blue line in this case is the unemployment rate. So look back at 2008. 
we knew unemployment spiked and we thought we would see a similar spike in claims, but we didn't. So as we can see, there's no obvious correlation here. That could be a positive sign though. Uh, it could mean that we are now able to manage claims more effectively, recognizing the difference between disability and employment concerns. But that's just speculation. We conclude we actually need a longer term view of these two rates to identify if there is a definitive link. So what about regional factors? What we see on this slide is lines representing different regions, but each, re each line is only in relation to itself. So while Ontario dipped and increased at a lower rate than other regions, it might still actually account for the most claims. We often speak about incidence rates in different regions. We spend a lot of time separating data between Quebec and the rest of Canada because we've recognized a consistent pattern over the years in that Quebec has higher incidence rates but shorter claims durations than the rest of the country. But we should not ignore the trend that has developed over the past couple of years where the incidence rate in Atlantic Canada is growing faster than all the other provinces. Atlantic Canada on your screen is the orange or yellow bar. So just a reminder that this graph is not showing more claims came from the East Coast than any other region, but it is showing relative to where each region was in 2012, Atlantic Canada has seen the biggest increase. Now there must be health reasons for the increase in incidence, right? Overall, we're a healthy nation, but we do have a problem with chronic disease. We know it's on the rise. Four chronic diseases, which are type two diabetes, certain cancers, cardiovascular disease and respiratory disease account for 65% of all deaths in Canada each year. Many of these people have more than two chronic diseases and sadly many of these are preventable conditions. Some of them can be linked to obesity and the percentage of the population in Canada who are obese has risen from 14 to 28% or essentially doubled since 1978. To continue our discussion about health factors, not surprisingly, with the rise in obesity, we see that only two in 10 Canadian adults meet the Canadian guidelines for physical activity, and diabetes diagnoses have almost doubled since the turn of the century. And we know mental health is an important aspect of overall health and well being. But is the impact on claims as significant as other factors? Over time, the proportion of Canadians who consider their mental health to be either very good or excellent has decreased slightly. Although many would think that mental health has been the biggest contributor to the increase in LTD claims, these diagnoses have increased at the same rate as diabetes. We'll talk more about mental health later in today's webinar, but the slide we're currently looking at demonstrates that there are still vast regional differences in incidence of mental health diagnoses, with these claims being the basis of 40% of Quebec long-term disability claims, but only 20% of the claims in the rest of Canada. This is something that's difficult to determine accurately though, as mental health conditions may be secondary diagnoses on many claims, but not captured in these studies. Also, Quebec was ahead of the rest of Canada in diagnosing mental health disorders, or we might notice that doctors in Quebec are diagnosing depression when other Canadian doctors might have actually used a diagnosis of fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue as the primary condition. Another factor that we need to keep in mind is that termination rates in Quebec are much higher than the rest of Canada. And before we move on from this slide, some of you might be looking at the um, bar on the right-hand side indicating the diagnoses categories. So I'll just define these. The one on the bottom, MNN, is the old-fashioned definition mental and nervous conditions. Uh, OMB 
is other musculoskeletal and back conditions. And IOB stands for injuries other than back. We've noticed that claim management has really evolved over the decades, and some of the emerging elements are very exciting for those of us in the industry. But let's start talking about the foundational elements first. These are traditional claim management steps, and they begin right at the time of claim. So we receive a claim, we review the medical and policy information, and we use judgment and experience to determine if the claim is payable or not. This was really 90% of the work back in the early days of group claims when we referred to it as claim processing, not really claim management. And while we have evolved, these elements have remained the foundation through time. So you see them continued along the horizontal axis representing time. Enhancements to claim systems have improved the accuracy of benefit calculations, eligibility assessments, and application or identification of other policy provisions. These enhancements have allowed us to automate many procedures, which has freed up time for disability team members to focus on claim management and do thorough information gathering with telephone interviews, rehab consultant in-person visits, and other research. In recent years, more and more claim departments have been using predictive analytics to better triage claims and to help identify those that are likely to resolve without any intervention, claims that are likely to continue beyond the change of definition into age 65, so claims that don't need a lot of intervention, and claims that will require active management. This helps the claim staff prioritize their work and focus on the customers that need the most assistance with return to work planning, which is actually our number one goal. We are now beginning to see emerging claim management elements, innovations that will allow us to provide faster assistance to some customers, and in many cases, help to prevent work absences altogether. I'm going to give just a little bit of information about each of the topics that we've listed here in this white box. So to start with accelerated access. This is a program in place in the UK that provides a faster route to market for strategically important and transformative treatments, medications, devices, and diagnostics, giving patients faster access to these. Artificial intelligence. There are many ways AI can enhance the claim management process. One example of this would be for the claim system to recognize many keywords in the documents in a claim file, including the notes captured in telephone interviews, claimants reported activities of daily living, medical reports, etc., and use this information to compare to other similar claims to establish an estimated duration or identify potential next steps, or even to highlight some red flags. Internet behavioral analysis. So we might not call it this, but many of us have actually begun to use these types of apps and websites in our everyday life. There are apps that encourage people to take more steps in a day, rewarding them when they reach milestones and set new goals. There are similar sites to encourage people to change other behaviors, uh, like smoking cessation or even helping them read more. Pharmacogenetics. Genetic testing to identify whether someone is genetically predisposed to certain medical conditions has been a huge topic of discussion and some controversy over the past couple of years. Now, there are now genetic tests that can be done to identify if a person might not metabolize certain medications and help doctors prescribe the medication most likely to be effective, getting it right the first time, preventing side effects, and even reducing time off from work, and also saving on drug costs. Insurance companies are beginning to explore the use of this in helping their disability claimants get the right medication faster. I had a conversation with leaders from Canadian insurers last week, and we're all actually at various stages in pilot 
projects with this pharmacogenetics. Um, and we're all really optimistic that it's going to help us and our customers a lot. Online CBT. Cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT, being done online has already been shown to really help patients who may not otherwise have access to this important treatment. It could be because they live in a remote area with no nearby treatment providers, or it could be there are long waiting lists in their region to see the right provider. Or even their condition might prevent them from leaving the home, and this is the best way for them to get the treatment they need. Overall, as you can see from the vertical axis, the layering on of these new innovations improves the accuracy, effectiveness, and speed of claim management. So what do all of these trends add up to? We're beginning to see the need for new products such as disability insurance for workers beyond age 65. But when considering new products, we have to keep in mind that incidence is rising steadily due to a combination of factors, not all of which are perfectly well understood. Termination rates are not keeping pace with new claims, so more claims are remaining on the books. Mental health claims are increasing in about the same proportion as other claim diagnoses. We're seeing some different patterns emerging in Quebec and Atlantic Canada. And we have to remember there is considerable volatility in this benefit. It's important to track and understand the patterns. As we begin to understand the factors that are contributing to the incidence increase, new factors come into play every year. We always want to be on the lookout for emerging trends. In every small business, employees make a big impact. When just one person can't work, the consequences are real and immediate in lost business opportunities, high replacement costs, low productivity, and lower team morale. So now I would like to talk more about what our best practices are at Empire Life. One of the best ways to manage long-term disability claims is to prevent them altogether. Short-term disability can be a great way to reduce the number of LTD claims that occur. Different types of short-term coverage may not manage the claims the way we do at Empire Life, which can lead to a higher rate of long-term claims. And you've probably all seen the stats that show that a worker who is off work for more than four months is significantly less likely to return to work. You'll probably hear me repeat that fact a few times in this webinar. Some of the key aspects of disability management are shown up on your screen. We can help employees who are off work due to illness or injury return to work quickly and safely. We focus on healthy outcomes, providing a full range of disability management services that follow industry best practices. So employees receive the support they need when they need it. Where we stand out is in our personal service. Our team is dedicated, passionate, and involved. Your customers and their employees who are off work due to illness or injury will know what to expect and will feel well supported. This sounds great, right? But can we demonstrate this? We've chosen to add some case studies to our presentation today to emphasize how we do this. I'd like to start by illustrating our approach with a mental health case study, since we all know mental health is an important aspect of disability claims. So this is a story about Chris. Chris grew up in Bathurst, New Brunswick. His uncle Richard suffered from depression his whole life, so Chris was aware of what that looked like. After university, Chris accepted work assignments that took him further and further west until finally he landed in Saskatoon. Last October, Chris started to have uncomfortable and unfamiliar feelings, including uncharacteristic angry outbursts and a deep sadness. He went to see his family doctor in Saskatoon, who referred him to a psychiatrist and told him to take time off work. But his appointment with the psychiatrist was five weeks away. When Chris called home, his mom suggested he return to Bathurst while he waited. Two days later, Chris was on a plane home. 
our claim manager and return to work facilitator recognized the benefit of this temporary move home. They suggested that Chris find out if he could see a psychiatrist in Bathurst, since the Acadian Peninsula had lower wait times than the rest of the province. Chris followed up and got an appointment later that week. The doctor there prescribed medication and cognitive behavioral therapy with a psychologist, which his benefits covered. And slowly, Chris started to feel better. To avoid losing momentum, our claim manager worked with the doctors and therapists in both provinces to set up the appropriate treatment in Saskatoon so that Chris could start a graduated return to work plan when he was ready. She also kept his manager up to date, so he was ready for Chris when he returned to work. By being flexible and creative, we got Chris into treatment and back to work a month sooner, which translated into savings in disability payments and wages for a contract worker to replace Chris. And the number one thing is Chris felt better sooner. One of the most important things about our story about Chris is that the claim manager and return to work facilitators work together. We're going to talk a little bit about each role in our team and what their jobs are. The decision makers in the claims department, although they might have different titles at different insurance companies, are the claim managers and the return to work facilitators. These are the people who are applying all of their knowledge and the tools available to them to assess the eligibility of the claim. And once a claim is approved, to determine the best steps to take to resolve the claim and help the disabled claimant return to work. So what skills are we looking for in a claim manager? Uh, as you can see from this list, which is only a sampling, uh, we're looking for a pretty versatile and flexible person. And we know they can't do this job alone, which is why we work with expert medical consultants and a huge network of service providers across the country. Although we have the ability to gather a lot of the information in forms and reports and using telephone interviews, some things still need to be done face to face. When it comes to helping someone access community resources and treatment providers near them, a rehab consultant who can meet with them in person to make these arrangements can be the most effective. Let's look at another case study to demonstrate the kind of thinking required to be a great claim manager. In this story, a hardworking and successful chartered accountant from Ottawa Sarah was on her dream vacation, skiing in Austria, when she took an unfortunate tumble and broke her back in seven places. Sarah was air ambulanced to a hospital in Vienna where the treating surgeon inserted plates and screws to stabilize her spine. Back home in Ottawa on a graduated return to work schedule, Sarah started having severe back pain. She paused her return to work program and booked an appointment with her orthopedic surgeon. Looking at new x-rays, her surgeon here said a screw had shifted and Sarah needed surgery. Before operating, he wanted to know exactly what hardware the Austrian surgeon had used and he was having trouble getting this information. Two weeks had passed with no reply. Every day they waited for the records from Austria resulted in another day of pain for Sarah and stress for her colleagues who were handling Sarah's files while she was off. Also, there were expensive LTD payments as Sarah earned over $300,000 a year and LTD is paid at 60% of her salary. And of course, there was the further delay in her return to work. The claim manager thought to ask Sarah if she had made use of her out of country benefit. And of course she had. So Empire Life asked our travel emergency service provider to reach out to the hospital, obtain and translate the surgical records and share them with Sarah's surgeon in Ottawa. One week later, Sarah's surgeon had the records in hand. Sarah's surgeon here was able to perform the second surgery, relieving Sarah's pain. 12 weeks later, Sarah finished her graduated return to work and was back full time. 
In this case, our intervention with one phone call expedited Sarah's surgery and saved the plan weeks, if not months, of LTD payments. Sometimes, if we look at a claim the right way, the solution can be very simple. Sometimes it's not. So let's talk more about that. Disability claim management is not a linear process. We begin with claim information and telephone interviews. We develop a case management plan and we use our toolkits to put the plan to work. But claims need to be constantly monitored. Is the person progressing? Do we need to rejig the plan? It's really vital to keep track of where we are with each claim and our case management tools can help us do that. So we write a case management plan to ensure that all the steps that should be taken to help resolve an absence effectively are taken by each claim manager with every absence. A workflow management system is used to automatically alert claim managers and their managers about upcoming claim milestones. It also generates reports for claim managers to bring forward for review. Claim manager and return to work facilitator toolkits ensure that an effective return to work plan is developed for each individual's unique circumstance. An LTD claim has many decision points where information is gathered and a plan is put in place, but this cycle continues until the claim reaches a resolution point. There are many possible resolutions that we monitor on our case management plan, so we're always aware if we're looking towards a return to work or a return to a different occupation, or we might have cases where the claimant decides not to return to work, but wants to explore another option on their own. And in some cases, the claimant may be unable to work in any occupation until age 65. It's important for a claim manager to always have a good view of what the expected resolution is, so they know what amount of effort is required for each claim. Big part of this whole process is our toolkits. Now, as we've noted earlier, the world of claim management is ever evolving, and so are our toolkits. This is just a snapshot of the most frequently used tools. But like we said, the lists are always evolving, and as new technology and innovation comes into play, we'll see some big changes in these toolkits. I'm not going to review this slide line by line. I'm just going to highlight one factor on each side of it. So on our claim manager side, let's talk about home visits. When we feel we need a face-to-face -face meeting to gather more information or introduce a new plan, a home visit can be the best option. This could include more complex cases where we feel the need to spend more time with the person or observe them in their home environment, offer them that personal contact where they might be hesitant to provide information over the phone, or in some cases where a translator might be needed. A home visit might be the best option. And on the right-hand side, under the Return to Work Facilitator Toolkit, I want to quickly talk about a work conditioning program, because this can really support small business owners who can't fund a Return to Work plan. So, Maybe we look at reconditioning in a fitness center or with a physiotherapist when we've got a physical claim. Or for cognitive restrictions, we can condition the employee through volunteer work or a day treatment program to get them back into that routine of working. We're going to talk about mental health now. We do get a lot of questions from advisors about mental health, so we wanted to make sure to include a section on this topic today. And we're gonna start this segment with another case study. This is a story about Jacques. Jacques appeared to have everything, a well-paying job that he loved, a beautiful wife, healthy kids, and a nice home. Very few people knew that he had attempted suicide when he was younger. When he went on disability leave for depression, his doctor said he was not a suicide risk. 
In our initial telephone interview, we learned that Jacques' wife had asked for a divorce. He was seriously overextended financially, and he felt like a failure at work. Jacques' team was making critical and costly errors that he was accountable for. There was simply too much stress in too many areas of his life, and he couldn't see a way forward. While on the phone, he advised the claim manager that he was planning to end his own life. Our claim managers are all trained to recognize when a threat is potentially real. So in this case, they took action. While listening, the claim manager searched online for the phone number of the police in Jacques town. And as soon as she got off the phone, she called the police and filled them in on Jacques situation. They asked her to call the local hospital and then they dispatched a car to look for Jacques. Finding him not at home, they drove to the other locations that we had suggested and they found Jacques 30 minutes later in his truck. Our claim manager, meanwhile, had called the hospital and Jacques' psychiatrist, so when the police brought him in, everything was ready. Jacques was admitted to a seven-day program in the psychiatric unit, and at the end of this program, the hospital said he could go back to work. But we thought it was unrealistic to expect Jacques to make a successful return to work with everything that was going on. So we arranged for him to attend a residential treatment program. His return to work facilitator worked closely with the program providers to develop a plan that would help Jacques regain his sense of self-worth and reintegrate into society. In the following weeks, we connected Jacques with a financial advisor, a family lawyer, and appropriate medical professionals. And we supported him while he got his life back in order. Everyone agreed a lower stress job would be the best place to start when it came time for Jacques to return to work. So we provided his full LTD benefit while he began volunteer work. When he progressed to a minimum wage job, we continued to provide his benefit slightly offset as his earnings began to increase. So after resolving his non-medical issues and adapting to work life again, Jacques made a full recovery and returned to his pre-disability career. Uncovering all the factors at play and partnering with his treatment providers allowed us to look at the big picture and surface all the underlying issues. And what's really important in this case is that you notice we did not disagree with the plan or change providers. We partnered with them to make sure all aspects and barriers were being addressed, and we ensured the treatment was goal-focused with an end goal of return to work. The care we delivered cost more in the short term, but it positioned Jacques for a successful and sustained return to work, avoiding future LTD costs, hospital stays, treatment costs, or worse. Jacques' case is that of a serious mental health condition. He was unable to work in his or any occupation for a period of time. But we receive many claims that are not like this. The article up on the screen is from 2014, but it applies equally well to today. We know doctors don't have a lot of time with their patients, and we know that people have access to unprecedented amounts of information online about conditions and symptoms. And we know that workplaces have gone through a lot of change and people are under a lot of pressure. So why are we seeing more and more disability claims for mental health related issues? As with all disability claims, there is a combination of reasons. Physicians have become quick to prescribe medications and diagnose patients with mental health diagnoses when the patient describes what is actually a normal emotional reaction to a situation. We are seeing this begin even with young children and society is adopting the same behavior. We want to make sure that removing the stigma around mental health and talking about it more doesn't mean more people going off work. It's important that people with mental health conditions feel supported and are able to stay at work or return to work as soon as possible. What we do know about mental health is 
mental health claims are increasing in the same proportion as other diagnoses, even though claims in Quebec are higher than the rest of Canada. We know we need a greater focus on prevention and early support in the short-term absence. We know someone off work for four months, which is that standard elimination period for LTD benefits, is significantly less likely to return to work than if they were off for a shorter amount of time. Physicians and other treatment providers, insurers, and employers need to be on the same page about mental health and its implications. This is a key point here. Absence from work is not always the best thing for the individual. In fact, studies have shown that the potential loneliness that is associated with being away from the workplace is one of the key factors that's preventing recovery from depression. We also know everyone is a unique individual and diagnosis does not equal disability. Many people have a mental health diagnosis. Stats say it's actually one in five Canadians, but this does not mean that a lengthy time off work is required in every case. So what are some of the things that can be done on the prevention front? You'll see right away on your screen that there's a lot more items under the prevention column than the LTD column to help us with mental health because the majority of the work we can do to help people with mental health is in that prevention phase of absence management. Small business owners may not have the HR capacity to understand and implement effective programs and accommodations, so any services that you as advisors can recommend to assist them will benefit them in the long run. And this is where we need to be creative together. If someone does have a mental health condition that prevents them from working, it could be a short-term disability. And one of the differentiators for us is that at Empire Life, we manage those short-term disability mental health claims with the same effort and tools we would apply to an LTD claim, recognizing the benefit of helping people get back to work as soon as possible. And as we said before, once someone has been off work long enough to apply for LTD, it can be very challenging to resolve with a return to work. So let's look at one final case study. In this case study, we're actually going to demonstrate where we have a justifiable absence from work that did not qualify as a disability claim. And I should mention that these case studies all came from real claim examples. We've just changed the region, names, maybe even the diagnosis in some cases and some of the details to protect the privacy of our members, but they are all real cases we've experienced. So this is a story about Dominic. When Dominic's daughter was one, she developed alarming symptoms. She could move her head, neck, and arms, but nothing below the waist. Dom took her to the local hospital where she remained an inpatient for five days. The doctors thought her symptoms were neurological and they ordered tests, including MRI scans of her brain and spinal cord. All the test results were normal, so she was transferred to the children's hospital in the city nearby where she was admitted for a further 10 days for observation. Dominic found it difficult to be on time for shifts because he was traveling back and forth to visit his daughter. His boss advised him to take time off work, which he did. But we did not approve his claim because Dominic himself was not disabled. When we decline a claim, we're not saying the person should be at work necessarily. In this case, it may have been reasonable for Dominic to be absent from work, but it did not qualify as a disability benefit. Employers should have policies in place to handle these kinds of circumstances, but many small businesses do not have them. As an advisor, you can help by understanding all the options available when someone's absent from work. We have some tips for you in a few slides. I believe the case studies that we've shared today have demonstrated the importance of focusing on the individual and asking the right questions to understand all the factors, both medical and non-medical, that affect a claim so we know exactly how and when we can help. Our intervention early on helps employers know what to expect. We also help them support their employees in situations they may not have known how to navigate without us. 
the reduction in claim duration helps our customers save money in many different ways. Specializing in small to mid-sized businesses means our customers get all of our attention and our best people are fully aware of the aspects that make these sized companies different from large businesses. We recognize that each claim might be a customer's first claim, and so we take the time to educate them about everything they will encounter with the disability claim experience. And as a small business, they may not be able to afford all the accommodations to assist an employee in their return to work, but we know how to help. One thing we do extremely well is collaborate. We recognize that it's difficult to find claim managers that have each and every skill. So we look at the team as a whole and we expect that the claim managers will work together to discuss difficult cases and come up with solutions. It's important to build a team that complements each other. Everyone brings their specialty to the table, so they work together to get the best results. We provide creative, flexible solutions to help meet the needs of the customers and the claimant. Now, as promised, I have a few tips and suggestions for you to help our customers. Sometimes absence from work is justified and employment standards outline timeframes for absences that employers need to allow for various reasons, but who pays for that time off? It's not always a short-term disability or long-term disability benefit. Employment insurance offers an array of benefits for people who are absent from work for an illness that doesn't qualify for STD or LTD or an illness that is not their own. An important differentiator is in the bottom left corner on your screen there. Employment insurance is really looking if someone's been diagnosed with a condition that prevents them from doing their own job, whereas disability insurance is looking at their own occupation. And there are cases where it makes a difference. Auto insurance is the first payer in some provinces and has different definitions than our short-term and long-term disability plans. I won't go into the provincial differences here and they do change from time to time. So it's always good to keep up to date on that. But one note is we see this come up over and over again. Um, lawyers like to equate the two-year catastrophic review in the auto insurance world with our any occupation definition. And really the only similarity is that two-year time frame. They're, it's really apples and oranges. They're looking at a catastrophic diagnosis versus someone's ability to work. Most of you are aware of the benefits associated with workers' compensation, and probably you're also aware of how employers are sometimes hesitant to make workers' comp claims. So what's important to note about that is, first, it is a requirement of their insurance contract to apply when there's a workplace claim. And as we know in Ontario, even workplace harassment claims are starting to be recognized by WSIB. And it's also important to let the employers know that there are benefits workers comp can offer with vocational rehabilitation and retraining that are beyond what an LTD carrier can fund. Finally, we would like to highlight these five topics on your screen that come up pretty frequently with the assessment and management of disability claims. And we don't expect advisors in our sales teams to be experts about these best practices. That's our job for sure. But it is helpful if everyone is aware of these things. I'm just quickly going to make a few points about each of these. Um, change of carrier guidelines is something that CLIA developed with all the associated insurance carriers. Uh, and we should all be aware of this. But I know for a fact that there are claim managers at different companies that aren't always aware of the guidelines and how to follow them. So if you ever hear uh, an insurance company refer to these guidelines, they are, um, you know, obviously aware that they're in place and it's important to follow them. Remember, we all need to know about absences at the insurance company, even if it's being paid by 
uh, workers' compensation or auto. So in both of the next two sections, I've highlighted notification of claim. Um, this is important for waiving premiums and making sure that if one of those other benefits does stop paying and they want to turn to an LTD benefit, that there hasn't been too much time that's passed. So it's important to always notify the insurance company of an absence from work. And of course, I'm sure you've all been made aware of the privacy laws in place that are different in every province, but overall really limit the information that the insurance company can share with the advisor and the employer. I certainly agree that if we all had all the details about every claim, we would always be on the same page, but unfortunately we just can't provide those details. And lastly, the appeal and complaint process. We do have uh, standard processes and timeline, timelines for customers to submit an appeal or a complaint, and we will certainly walk through those with an advisor, an employer, or a claimant that would like to know how to file an appeal or a complaint. So I'd like to thank you all very much for your time today. I hope we have achieved the goals of this presentation, which in summary are to explain some of the trends in disability and the future challenges, to discuss Empire Life's disability management strategy, and review the impact of mental health and how advisors and employers can help. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Taryn, who's going to guide us through some of your questions. Thank you, Sheila. So we're now going to answer some of the questions that came in during the webinar. You can also take this opportunity to add any questions you have by entering them into the GoToWebinar widget at the right of your screen. Please note, if we don't get to your question today, we will reach out to connect you with the information you need. So I'm just gonna give some time to see if any questions have come in. All right, so for our first question, uh, someone has asked, it was acknowledged that many clients are smaller organizations that lack dedicated HR resources. In addition to product information, are there supports available to help preventative programming? Uh, that is a great question. So um, there's a few different ways to answer that because uh, it's hard to know what you mean by um, supports available. So from the insurance company, from Empire Life, um, you know, one thing that we certainly would like to do is answer any questions customers have as soon as they have them. So if someone has an employee who has indicated they might be going off work due to a disability or has recently gone off work, even if they only have LTD with us, if you have any questions, touch base with us as soon as possible because it's much easier to help someone navigate a return to work if it's sooner rather than later. If we're telling someone they're not going to be eligible for a benefit and they've only been absent a few days, they'll probably be able to return to work happier than if they have been off unpaid for four months and then find that out. But some other things to think about as far as prevention, uh, with small businesses, there's no one size fits all. Your population at work um, is really, you know, it's really different. Someone who's running a small mechanic garage is going to be different than, you know, a 60 person office environment. So um, something we can learn from a big company like Starbucks is poll your employees, ask them what you can do to help them. Um, you know, this is some great advice we can give, but I bet there, if I had to say one thing that would have the most effect across all of our customer population, I would say it would be to encourage and support exercise and movement. This is gonna help us prevent both physical and mental disabilities. Um, you know, we're talking about a population like we saw here that is really not meeting the standards of physical activity. And so small businesses might not be able to fund gym memberships or have gym equipment in their office, but to really encourage people who want to have some time in the day to get up and move, even if it's just going for a walk at lunch or allowing them, you know, to go to a gym or something, um, during the day and, and really support movement during the day. I, I think that one thing could make a huge difference. 
That's a great suggestion, Sheila. I know at BBD we definitely take advantage of the better weather and have walking meetings sometimes too. So even That's if a great you're idea. Mm -hmm. unable to get out on your lunch break or have free time, you can always take your work outside and get moving and helps the brain flow and get ideas, get ideas going. Mm -hmm. So I have another question here. Uh, what does Empire suggest advisors do or do more of to better help clients handling a situation like a disability claim? Um, it's important that advisors have a good understanding of policy provisions. Um, you know, like we said before, as advisors in the insurance company, we've read insurance contracts a million times. And even though we've provided these customers with a copy of um, their contract, they may have never even read it. So for the advisor to have a really good understanding of the policy provisions is really helpful. Um, and also helpful to set the expectations of the customers around the information the insurance company might require and timeframes. So a good example of that is that horrible pre-existing condition um, exclusion that applies in a lot of cases. If our customers understand why it's in the policy, what information we're looking for, you know, that we'll probably need to request provincial health care records and that might take some time. Um, that just really, really helps set the customer's mind at ease. Um, another thing is maybe to encourage employers to share any information they have right from the beginning. I know, you know, employers might be hesitant to let us know if there were any problems going on at work, but it's really important to recognize the difference between performance management and disability. So, um, you know, anything they can, they can tell us to help us understand all aspects of the claim is, is helpful. Wonderful. I'm just waiting to see here if any more questions come up. But as we said before, we always have the ability to uh, reach out to you directly and answer any questions if they come in um, afterwards, or you can always contact us at BBD and we can handle your questions from there. So that looks like all of our questions now for this webinar. So I'd like to say a big thank you to Sheila for talking about disability claims management and the approach undertaken by Empire Life today. It's great to see what a shared commitment there is between our organizations to help working Canadians. We appreciate all of you joining us today and thank you for your questions. Watch for the recording and a follow-up survey. We hope to be in touch with all of you again soon, but in the meantime, remember to connect with Empire Life and BBD on LinkedIn, Twitter, or via your BBD regional director. Thanks and have a great day.